Today, I'm going to be looking at, um, we're really looking at sort of the expansion of the Brazilian ayahuasca religions um, as sort of a, a foundation or, or backdrop for exploring uh, conflicts between law and culture that are uh, inherent in our current uh, inter international legal sort of paradigm. Uh, so we'll start with going over, um, thank you. We'll s let's see, there we go. We'll start with going over the uh, three sort of foundational uh, international drug conventions that sort of provide this uh, outline for looking at uh, drug use and uh, movement internationally. Um, so these are the three uh, major ones. And the basic sort of purpose behind these uh, is to sort of, was to foster sort of international cooperation in uh, combating addiction um, and preventing that and controlling uh, movement and uh, traffic, um, in some cases, of different substances. So we'll talk about each of these briefly. Uh, the first one uh, is the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. And this uh, primarily focuses on plants. So we're looking primarily at uh, coca, opium, and marijuana. And uh, within this, um, we see the primary purpose, again, of sort of combating uh, addiction. And to some extent, uh, this convention allowed traditional use to continue for a period of 25 years. So under this convention, traditional uses of marijuana and coca were supposed to have been eliminated uh, by 1986. Uh, there were some sort of medical exemptions, but they're very strictly regulated uh, that if a country wanted to grow opium, they had to uh, record exactly where it was being grown, how many hectares, all that product would have to be collected in a central location, distributed through pharmacies, things like that. So a very sort of biomedical model is being uh, promoted under this convention. So the 1971 convention is, uh, I believe was mentioned earlier this morning, and this is the one that's uh, of primary concern to ayahuasca. Uh, there are no plants actually discussed or prohibited uh, under this convention, but DMT is prohibited. And so there's been a confusion and disagreement about what that means regarding ayahuasca. Uh, interestingly, there's this other um, exception that was allowed that uh, countries with traditional uses uh, of psychoactive drugs by particular ethnic groups could make a reservation at the time of signing on to the treaty. So the important things uh, that we're really looking at is we're looking at uh, plants that are native to that territory and cultures that are specific to uh, particular countries. The 1988 convention um, is, deals more with trafficking and is important uh, basically for the introduction of a, a little bit of new language that was actually brought to the table by uh, the countries of Peru and Bolivia. Um, so this idea of respect for traditional licit uses. And of course by 1988, all traditional uses of coca and marijuana and opium were supposed to have been eliminated. Right, uh, But of course, in Bolivia and Peru, these are major parts of the cultural patrimony, and this has been an ongoing issue for some South American countries about getting recognition for these practices uh, internationally. So sort of to summarize, uh, we have some very basic uh, sort of ideas or things that come out of these three conventions that really guide uh, international law. So these are, when looking at psychoactive drug use, they're permissible and regulated, uh, highly regulated medical contexts. And they're also uh, permissible if a country has made a reservation, uh, but they could only make reservations for groups that are highly localized ethnic groups with historical, tra uh, histor historical traditions around use of these substances. So we're looking at very sort of specific, very limited groups that could get permission uh, to continue these sort of psychoactive plant traditions.
Okay. So I'm sure at this point it's the last day of the conference, the third day of the ayahuasca track, so people are probably familiar with uh, the Brazilian ayahuasca religions if you weren't already. Um, but these are uh, religions with roots uh, generally in the uh, early to mid uh, 20th century. Um, some people would describe them as syncretic, uh, others uh, prefer not to use that terminology, but we do see sort of um, a bringing in of, of different types of traditions uh, into these churches, including, of course, the shamanic use of plants, uh, elements of Catholicism, um, Afro-Brazilian spiritism, and other sorts of traditions. Uh, so, before moving on, to point out that these are not actually, um, you know, these churches are, are 19th or 20th century, excuse me, manifestations, so there's questions about, um, you know, the historicalness of their nature, and uh, they're also not uh, indigenous um, practices per se, although those come into uh, the tradition. So in the last um, 30 to 40 years, uh, the Santo Daime and UDV specifically are the two groups that have really uh, expanded internationally. Uh, we really see that starting in uh, late 80s and early 90s, really this sort of international growth appearance in uh, Europe, uh, North America, and other parts uh, of the globe. So when we're working in this international context where we have these sort of historical and geographical limitations on the use of plants, it's important to sort of understand what are we talking about? What, what was meant when they used this language. And so looking at, say, uh, uh, ayahuasca, for example, we have some of the first recorded uses come from the 1850s. So we know it's at least that old, uh, but there's some debate uh, about exactly how historic um, use of ayahuasca is. There are authors and academics that have claimed that this goes back uh, thousands of years, and there are are other people that have uh, made strong uh, arguments against this interpretation. Um, so it's a little ambiguous how historical these are, but we do know that um, the Brazilian ayahuasca religions have a very recent origin in the 20th century. So the question is, is that significantly historical uh, for an exemption under this international uh, paradigm? Uh, and again, I, the Native American church was uh, mentioned in the last uh, presentation, and we can again use this as sort of a parallel, is uh, the Native American church actually has its origins in the 19th century and wasn't really firmly established uh, as a church until the 20th century. But a lot of the sort of legal and cultural arguments that have been made in the United States uh, for the preservation and for the legal rights of the different uh, tribes that participate in the church was this historical nature of it. And we do have archeological evidence uh, showing ceremonial use that goes back 5,000 years. So even though these traditions are uh, fairly recent, uh, there was this reliance on history in order to argue sort of a, a legitimacy to these practices. Uh, so the other issue is sort of this issue of uh, culture and locality. So there's this clear idea in the conventions that a cultural practice is okay as long as it stays confined to the geographic area in which it originated. And of course history is marked by uh, immigration and cultural flows and exchanges. And so this idea of a culture that doesn't move outside of particular political, arbitrary political boundaries is really pretty absurd. Uh, so there's some strong questions about this, these sort of ideas that are being promulgated and, and relied upon uh, within these uh, international treaties. Um, and so we have this idea of, just real quickly, this idea of tying culture uh, to particular geographic regions um, a lot of academics will trace this uh, back to the end of the Thirty Years' War uh, in Europe with the Treaties of Westphalia, which is really uh, this idea of creating solid political boundaries where 
in a, a political elite would have control over uh, people and populations within uh, particular political uh, boundaries. And so this leads to ideas of sort of national integrity and uh, nationalism, uh, things like that, um, that of course have led to lots of problems in the modern world. Uh, the other problem that we know is that the world has always been global. We've always had people from different cultures interacting and intermingling, um, you know, and you go back to boats or, you know, use of horses or whatever, you've got people traveling distances and interacting with other people. Uh, of course, uh, in the 20th and now the 21st century, with modern technology, you can fly across continents in hours. Um, you can communicate by email or Skype or phone with people across the world. We have books, films, audio recordings of different sort of cultural events and things like that. So all of these things become highly tangible and highly accessible in the modern world. These are all technologies that facilitate cultural exchange. So this idea of culture being bound by certain uh, geographic boundaries is really increasingly absurd uh, as we move forward. Uh, and this brings us to the idea of uh, transnationalism. And, and the idea of transnational is usually discussed uh, in terms of ethnic communities that have a country of origin but that have transplanted uh, somewhere else. So we see that a lot uh, in the United States and other part of the world uh, with uh, Hispanic communities from various um, South American countries or uh, Islamic communities or other things like that that have ties to particular countries but are living in another country. So this sort of raises questions of where, where do these people belong? They have two potentially home countries, right? So which, which territory does one of these territories define you know, that culture? And moving beyond this, we have this idea of the transnation, which was proposed by uh, Arjuna Padurai, which is that you have these transnational communities that actually go beyond. It's not just ethnic communities anymore. We have transnational or transnations that are based upon religion or based upon empl employment or military service. So you have groups that are connected in different countries uh, but those connections are not necessarily cultural or ethnic, but they uh, are based on different sorts of ties. Okay, so what, one of the things we propose is that the Brazilian ay ayahuasca religions are sort of trans nations. You have all these uh, congregations that are appearing across the world, um, but they also even though these congregations are, are multi-ethnic, um, they retain these ties to Brazil and to the Amazon and, uh, where um, the ayahuasca plants, the uh, Banisteriopsis vine and Psychotria and other admixture plants are found. Uh, there are other uh, strong ties that, uh, you know, one of the things for a lot of groups, uh, the idea of sort of pilgrimage, visiting these areas is something that's important. Um, we also have ritual preparation, so sort of this idea of uh, perhaps, you know, wild-crafted, you know, ayahuasca, uh, something that's picked and harvested in its native community, and different rites and preparations that, that go along with that process. Um, also, Portuguese is sort of a, you know, a basic foundational uh, ritual language, and there are all sorts of, you know, I could go on, there are all sorts of these other sorts of ties that really tie these international communities back to uh, Brazil, where uh, these traditions originated. Uh, and to illustrate this case, there was a uh, legal case in the Netherlands a few years ago, and um, the Netherlands, of course, is one of our more progressive countries uh, in the world. Um, and the Netherlands actually recognizes a religious right uh, for groups to use ayahuasca within their country. Um, but they had a problem with people importing it. There are sort of international implications and other legal implications um, that the Netherlands felt a little uncomfortable with. So a man was um, 
arrested, charged with importation of DMT uh, in the form of ayahuasca. And uh, what this uh, individual or what this congregation did was they said that this is actually, this should be a protected religious practice because our Iow the ayahuasca we use is, is ritually prepared and it needs to come, it needs to go through this process and it needs to come from Brazil. Um, so we need to have this connection. And so they won uh, on, on that argument, but there's some interesting issues there. Um, so certainly um, the Netherlands is too high in latitude to probably grow Banisteriopsis outside in your garden, uh, but potentially it could be grown in a greenhouse. So there's some question about by making this legal argument, well, this is how they were acquiring ayahuasca at the time, um, they may have sort of created a situation where they're now sort of locked into uh, importing as their tradition. So if somebody started growing it on their own, um, that might create legal complications for other groups that are importing it because the government would say, well, these people have a greenhouse, so why can't you just grow it and stop importing it? So there is these sort of interesting um, a feedback between sort of the legal systems and the cultural uh, evolution of uh, some of these groups. Um, so of course, since these groups come from Brazil, it's sort of important to look at, at what's happening in Brazil. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the conventions, there is a mechanism for countries to make reservations and protect indigenous practices that in include the use of psychoactive plants. Um, Brazil did not do this when they signed on to this treaty. Uh, so they didn't have reservation, but they have domestically um, sort of addressed this issue internally. And so there's lots, um, so religiously, the religious use of ayahuasca within Brazil is something that's permitted, uh, even though they didn't make this reservation under the international laws. Um, one of the issues, though, then, that remains, there's this ambiguity about importation, exportation of ayahuasca. So if a group wants to bring ayahuasca from Brazil, can they do that? Um, and we've got more about that on the next slide. So Canada, uh, and I think I heard a couple people have mentioned this earlier, uh, but in 2006, Canada, um, a group of uh, Santo Daime congregation in Canada got tentative permission from the government to import ayahuasca for their religious ceremonies. Um, the stipulation was that the group had to get permission from Brazil to take it out of the country. And unfortunately, Brazil never responded to this request. So um, this sort of tentative acceptance uh, sort of languished for, uh, I guess, about six years. And then finally, last year, uh, the Harper government decided that they were going to withdraw uh, that permission completely. Um, so we see sort of a missed opportunity here, uh, potentially for um, Brazil to be sort of uh, perhaps a, to collaborate or cooperate um, to allow sort of international congregations to, to participate in practice. Uh, we have a similar issue in um, Spain where the groups can use legally there, but they can't bring it into the country. Um, so I'm going to have to speed up here. So there are some questions about what do we do with this? So one of, these, one of the ideas is that potentially Brazil could issue you know, export permits and they could cooperate uh, in this way. Um, or we could look to Bra uh, Bolivia as, as an example. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Bolivia's had a long-standing um, issue with the prohibition on coca uh, in these international conventions. And after years of trying to uh, get amended language that would recognize traditional uses, uh, they determined that they would actually have to withdraw completely from uh, the convention prohibiting coca use. So what they did is they withdrew. And how these treaties are set up is that you make reservations when you ratify them. So they withdrew, and they made a reservation, and then ratified the treaty again. So that's sort of another example of some way as, um, 
as we're probably not going to have any new conventions anytime soon. It's a mechanism for potentially weakening some of these more um, hardline positions uh, in these conventions. Uh, and I think I'm about out of time, so let's see. So basically, uh, to conclude, we, we have these international conventions, but they have these serious problems uh, at their foundation, this idea that um, culture is confined to specific locations, or this idea that culture is static and doesn't change or evolve over time. Uh, you know, there are very few traditions uh, that we have now that we can say go back a thousand years and there are very fewer ways to be able to prove that. Uh, culture is always changing. We have wars, we have disease, we have natural disasters and culture is what humans use to adapt to changes uh, in their environment. Uh, so this is something that we really need to look at. Um, unfortunately I didn't get to get to the medicine part um, but we will we'll go on to questions. Thank you, Kevin. If anyone has a question, please, you can go to the microphone in the middle of the room. And if you can limit yourself to one question, thank you. One of the very first, if not the first, religions would be the, sh the shamanic practices all over the world. It has been, after all, a source of medicine, a, a source of, indeed, the arts such as theater, and, indeed, a source of religious practice. Right. And I wonder what if, in law, it is possible to recognize a set of religious practices as diverse as Hinduism, why is it not possible to recognize shamanic practices as a legitimate religion? What is the legal obstacle? Right. Well, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I think these things vary a lot from country to country. And uh, being from the United States, I can, I can speak best about the United States um, that, you know, within uh, the states we really have the concept of religion is premised upon this sort of Judeo-Christian model. Um, you know, and I had mentioned the Native American church earlier and one of the ideas uh, behind calling it the Native American church or, or the reason why they actually incorporated as a church was there was some sense that well maybe this is something you know those white people will understand. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of difficulty in, in how we, we talk about these things and how we define these things and a lot of sort of preconceived notions about what it means to be a religion. Uh, so I think those are some of the problems and I think uh, in these international conventions we do see, you know, I mentioned we see sort of this pushing of, of biomedical models of drug use and I think we also see, you know, these pushing of these other sorts of sort of Western or uh, northern um, cultural sort of manifestations or understandings of culture and religion. So I don't, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it, it's sort of an ongoing sort of debate. It, it is just a profound... Please, please one question, so we can hear everyone. Thank you. It is just a profoundly striking observation that Hinduism, in the way that it ha has historically been practiced and it continues to be practiced in the Indus Valley is an incredibly diverse set of religious practices of a diversity comparable so, with shamanism. I'm sorry, that Kevin, has we're actually religious out of time. protection and shamanism does not. Right. And it is really strange. Right, definitely. Okay. Um, can we quick question? Very quick. Thank yeah, you. That I've I don't know if it was addressed in the previous talk, and I don't know if you're the right person, but my question is, how does import-export work for the UDV in the United States? How, how does that set up? Right. So, so <laughs> one of the things that's interesting about the United States is 
often we don't care that much about international treaties. <laughs> and, um, and this was one of the issues that actually came up uh, in the UDV case that, um, that Jeffrey Bronfman was just uh, talking about, is one of the arguments that the US government made was, look, we signed this international treaty prohibiting this substance, and so there's no way we can allow people to use it here. And the Supreme Court said, we signed a treaty? Who cares? You know? Um, so it was more, you know, the U.S. is sort of more interested about our, our own populations and our own laws. Uh, and as, um, it, as uh, Jeffrey pointed out, it is, you know, it was that agreement between the church and between uh, the federal government, specifically the DEA, that sort of uh, allowed that to happen. And of course, premised on the ideas of religious freedom. We're going to have to move okay. on, but I encourage okay, a anyone. A quick question to, on something. We don't, we don't have time for another question, I'm sorry. But please find Kevin afterwards, and thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. The, um, the next speaker is going to be uh, Ken Tupper. Um, his talk is entitled The...